Hello, I'm Kirk Weiler, and this is Common Core Algebra 2 by eMath Instruction. Today, we're starting a new unit. We're going to be doing unit number 9, lesson number 1, on imaginary numbers. And I don't think I need to say much more than that, because I think we need to get right into this topic. You have learned about a lot of different types of numbers in your life. Pretty much, you started off learning about the whole numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. My daughter, Evie, who's currently 7 and is going to be going into second grade next year, she knows about all these types of numbers. She's even known about them probably since kindergarten, maybe even before. But it takes a little while, and eventually you get up to the integers, right? Those are the whole numbers, but they also include negatives, and they can be ordered, right? You can put them in order. After that, though, come the rational numbers. Those are ratios of integers, things like one-half, three-fourths, negative four-fifths. They're the numbers that we oftentimes simplistically call fractions. Finally, there's numbers that you can't write as the ratio of two integers. Those are irrational numbers. We looked at those a little bit in Common Core Algebra 1. Numbers like pi, and we've seen the number e this year. Square roots of non-perfect squares, like the square root of 2. Those are irrational numbers. All of these are important numbers that you've learned about in the past. But at the end of the day, one thing is true about every single one of these numbers, and that's a simple fact. They are all real numbers. So what in the world is an imaginary number, right? An imaginary number is something that's totally different, is something totally, well, not real. So let's get into it right now. Okay, exercise number one. On the axes below, a sketch of y equals x squared is shown. So this is just y equals x squared. No big deal. Okay. It says, now consider the parabola whose equation is given by the function notation as f of x equals x squared plus 1. How is the graph of y equals x squared shifted to produce the graph of f of x? Pause the video right now and write this down really quickly. All right. Well, after all of our work, hopefully you know it's been shifted up one unit. Letter B says create a quick sketch of f of x on the axes below. Well, all right, great. If it was shifted up one unit, <laughs> then it must look something like this, with that being a 1. Okay. Letter C, what can be said about the x-intercepts of the function y equals f of x? So this is my f of x. What can you say to me about the x-intercepts of this function? Write something down. Well, you'd probably say something like, they don't exist, or there aren't any. You might even say, they aren't real numbers, but you'd probably just say they don't exist and that there aren't any. Now, in order to actually find x-intercepts, also known as zeros, right, what we would do is we would solve the equation set equal to zero. But what happens when we try to do that? Well, obviously we can subtract one from both sides and we get x squared equals negative one. And then we would take the square root and we'd get x equals plus or minus the square root of negative one. But we've talked about this many times. Using real numbers, you can't take the square root of a negative, right? And that's very simply because when we do a negative times a negative, we get a positive. And when we do a positive times a positive, we get a positive. So whatever the square root of negative 1 is, it can't be a real number. All right, now you might say, well, it can't be any number at all, because people have always told me that a positive times a positive is a positive, and a negative times a negative is a negative. But that's only true for the real numbers we're going to use that square root of negative 1 to help us define a whole new type of number today called an imaginary number. So pause the video now and write down anything you need to before we introduce you to the number i. All right, wait, what did he say? The number i? 
I is not a number, it's a letter. Yeah, so was E. All right, all cleared out. Let's talk about the definition of I. The base of the imaginary number system, known as I, is defined as I equals the square root of negative 1. Okay? So the base of the real number system is the number 1. You know, 1 plus 1 gives you 2, 1 plus 1 plus 1 gives you 3, 1 divided by 2 gives you 1 half, etc. But 1 is the most important number in the real number system. I is the most important number in the imaginary number system. The imaginary number system. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea from the name imaginary, okay? It's a little bit of an unfortunate choice for the name of, of anything, you know, because it makes you think like, well, this number only exists then, uh, you know, in fairy tales or something like that. But negative numbers seemed quite imaginary at one point, and imaginary numbers are used all over the place in engineering, especially electrical engineering and things having to do with electricity and magnetism. All right, so there is certainly, there is certainly, certainly an imaginary number i, but there's nothing imaginary about it. It exists, and we use it all the time. Now, today, we're going to see sort of some of the rules that i plays by, and let's play around with it now. All right, this, though, is the first non-real number you've ever seen. And again, it can't be real. It can't be real, because you can't take the square root of a negative number with a real number. All right, so let's play around with it. The first thing that we can immediately do once we have this idea, once we know that i equals the square root of negative 1, is we can start simplifying square roots of negative numbers. See, up till now, if I gave you this problem, I'd want you to look at it and go, that, that, that those don't exist. You can't do that. You can't take the square root of negative 9. You can't take the square root of negative 100. And yet, now we can with this new number. And specifically, we can break this up as the square root of 9 times the square root of negative 1. The square root of 9 is what it has been, which is 3, and the square root of negative 1 is i. So the square root of negative 9 is 3i. I bet you can figure out the square root of negative 100. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, did you get 10i? For the same reason, right? We can break that up as the square root of 100 times the square root of negative 1. That's obviously 10. This is what we just decided to call i. So we get 10i. Now, these last two, they're no real worse. It's just that 32 and 18 aren't perfect squares. Right? So as we're trying to break this up, we might say something like, oh, all right, well, let's say I take the root 16, let's say I have root 2, and let's say I have negative 1. Right? 16 times 2 times negative 1 will be negative 32. This we can make into a 4. This we can make into an i, and this we really can't do anything with. So how should we write it? Should we write it like this? Honestly, many times it's written like this, with the i coming between the 4 and the 2, and the two, root 2. And again, both are completely good. There are completely fine ways to write it. It doesn't matter. Why don't you simplify letter D? All right, letter D is much the same, in that we can break this up as the square root of 9, the square root of 2, and the square root of negative 1. This is 3, this is i, can't do anything with that, so typically written as 3i root 2. All right, so what's the first ramification for having i equal the square root of negative 1? Well, the first ramification is we can now take square roots of negative numbers. I want you to keep in mind, though, that none of these are real numbers. Okay, none of them are numbers like what we saw on that first slide when we had the list of all the different types. All right, pause the video now and write down anything you need to. Okay, I'm going to clear out the text. Let's keep going with this idea of I. Um, you know, because I is involved with square roots, it can also be involved when we solve the 
what are known as incomplete quadratics. An incomplete quadratic, right, a quadratic is anything with an x squared term in it. An incomplete quadratic is one where there's no x to the first. All right, and we can always solve those by just undoing what's been done to x. So we've got x, we've squared it, multiply by 5, add 8, get negative 12. Well now, as we start to solve this, and we get 5x squared is equal to negative 20, and divide both sides by 5, we get x squared equals negative 4. And now as we take the square root, don't forget to put that plus minus in, we still get it but we get plus minus the square root of negative 4, which we can now write as plus minus root 4 times root negative 1. So the, our answers here will be plus or minus 2i. All right, there it is. Why don't you go ahead and try to solve letter B and letter C? Okay, let's go through. They're pretty easy. Again, they've got some annoying things about them. For instance, on this one, we will subtract a 20 from both sides, and we're gonna get 1 half. X squared is equal to negative 18. Maybe multiply both sides by two, and we'll get X squared is equal to negative 36. And then take the square root of both sides, introduce that plus minus. Lots of students are going to forget that. Break it up, it's root 36, root negative 1. So we get plus or minus 6i. All right, simple enough. Okay, let's do this last one. Let's add 10 to both sides. We'll get 2x squared is equal to negative 26. Sorry about that. Negative 26. We'll divide both sides by 2, and we'll get x squared equals negative 13, which isn't particularly nice. It's not a perfect square, 13 at least. That's okay. Now, normally the way this one would be written is we'd write it like this. Oh, forgot to introduce the plus minus. Most of the time, this thing would be written as plus or minus i times the square root of 13. All right? Easy enough. Okay, pause the video now and think about what we just did. All right, I'm going to clear out the text. And let's keep going. Okay. Which of the following is equivalent to 5i times 6i? All right. Well, this is simple enough. Most of the properties that we still work with with numbers still work. Things like commutative and associative. So I can rearrange this as 5 times 6 times i times i. Now, obviously, we all know what 5 times 6 is. That's 30. And i times i will be i squared. What do we do with i squared? Well, i squared, by definition, is negative 1, right? And this is very important, okay? Very, very important. A lot of students memorize that i is the square root of negative 1, but probably just as important is the fact that i squared is negative 1. And you'll see what ramification that has immediately in the next problem. So two things you want to know about i. i is equal to the square root of negative 1, and likewise i squared is equal to negative 1 itself. Okay? So be mindful of that. Pause the video now and write down anything you need to. Okay, I'm going to clear out the text. Okay, now one of the coolest things about i is that the powers of i show a remarkable, remarkable pattern. And in order to really understand this pattern, you have to be very, very confident with exponent laws. Okay, now let's take a look at the pattern. i to the first, 
is i. i to the second is negative 1. Okay, we just looked at those two things. Now, what is i to the third? Well, i to the third can be thought of as i to the second times i to the first. Now, I just pause for a minute. Make sure you feel comfortable with that. Feel comfortable with that? I mean, that's just a simple, simple definition. But i to the second is negative 1. And i to the first is just i. So i to the third can be written more simply as negative i. Now what's i to the fourth? Well, i to the fourth is i to the second times i to the second. But i to the second is negative 1. i squared is negative 1. So i to the fourth is just equal to 1. Isn't that cool? All right. Well, now what's i to the fifth? Well, watch what I'm going to exploit now. i to the fifth is i to the fourth times i to the first. Give me just a second. Oops, not that. I'm going to really make sure that looks like a four. Because four is very important here. How's that? Much better. But i to the fourth is one. And therefore, i to the fifth is one times i to the first. So i to the fifth is just i. Now i to the sixth is i to the fourth times i to the second, but i to the fourth is one, so i to the sixth is just i to the second, but that's negative one. i to the seventh is i to the fourth times i to the third, but i to the fourth is just one, so i to the seventh is i cubed, and i cubed is equal to negative i. And i to the 8th is i to the 4th times i to the 4th, which is negative 1 times negative 1. Oh my gosh! Which is no again. way! Do you see the pattern? This thing's just going to keep repeating itself. If I now went to i to the 9th, it would be i. i to the 10th would be negative 1. i to the 11th would be negative i. i to the 12th would be 1 i to the 13th would be i, i to the 14th would be negative 1, etc. So whenever we raise i to any integer power, you have one of four results. Either it's just i, or it's negative 1, or it's negative i, or it's 1. And the real key to all of this is knowing that i raised to any multiple of 4 will always be equal to 1, and then you can take it from there. All right. So we're going to exploit this pattern in the next problem. But pause the video now and write down anything you need to. OK, I'm going to clear this out. And let's do some powers of i. Exercise 5, from the pattern in exercise 4, simplify each of the following powers of i. Now again, there, there, there's only a few choices, and what I'm going to do right away is I'm going to write this on the side of my paper. i to the first is i. i to the second is negative 1. i to the third is negative i. And i to the fourth is equal to 1. Every one of these answers is going to be one of these four, and let me show you how you do it. Take a look at the 38. All right, again, the real key is powers of 4, or multiples of 4. 38 is equal to 36 plus 2. So i to the 38th is equal to i to the 36th times i to the second. Step back and think about that for a moment, okay? But i to the 36 would have to be 1, because 36 is a multiple of 4. i squared is negative 1. So i to the 38th is negative 1. Hmm. Let's talk about i to the 21st, right? 21 is equal to 20 plus 1, where that is a multiple of 4. So i to the 21st is equal to i to the 20th times i to the 1st. But i to the 20th is equal to 1, and i to the 1st is just i. So i to the 21st is equal to i. 
why don't you try to do it for letter C and letter D? All right, well, letter D may have actually been a little bit hard, but this one should be pretty easy. 83 is 80 plus 3, and again, the key here is that 80 is a multiple of 4. So I to the 83rd is going to be I to the 80th times I to the 3rd, and that's going to be 1 times I to the 3rd, but I to the 3rd is negative I. And finally, i to the 40th, that may have been the trickiest one of all because 40 already is a multiple of 4, so i to the 40th is just 1. We don't really have to do anything with that. Okay, pause the video now and write down anything you need to. Okay, I'm going to clear out the text. Let's do one more problem, and then we'll finish up this lesson on imaginary numbers. All right, exercise six, which of the following is equivalent to five i to the 16th plus three i to the 23rd plus i to the 26th? All right, well, for a minute, let's forget about the five, the three, and whatever. Let's just work on each one of these. i to the 16th, what is that equal to? Well, 16 is already a multiple of four, so i to the 16th is just one. Let's do i to the 23rd i to the 23rd is i to the 20th times i to the 3rd. So that's 1 times i to the 3rd, and i to the 3rd is negative i. And finally, i to the 26th is i to the 24th times i squared. Again, this 20, this 24 are multiples of 4, so that'll be 1 times negative 1, which is negative 1. So I'm going to put in these three things for these three. So what will I get? I'll get 5 times 1 plus 3 times negative i plus well, negative 1. So that's 5 minus 3i minus 1. And that's going to be 4 minus 3i. Choice 2. All right. Pause the video now and write down anything you need to, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. And we're going to work a lot more with I and its arithmetic in the next lesson, but let's wrap up this one now. So today, you got introduced to a new type of number. Now granted, you'd already seen E this year, but E wasn't a new type of number, even though it was a new number. E was an irrational number, and you'd seen those before. But today you learned about i, the square root of negative 1, the basis of all imaginary numbers. And in the next lesson, imaginary numbers are going to give rise to a more sort of broad class of numbers called complex numbers. All right, And we're just going to be investigating those a little bit in this course. For now, I'd like to thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.